But welcome to what is, I believe, hopefully, uh, at least from the perspective of, of the extreme weather front, uh, the last live office hours that I'm going to host this week. Uh, I've said that before and been wrong, but I do think that uh, following today's system, and there is one, another one, uh, coming down uh, through uh, California as we speak. If you've been in the Bay Area today, you were hit by a pretty short, sharp one. I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. But I do think we're going to get a bit of reprieve. So although there will be some additional precipitation coming into Southern California tonight, uh, after this system makes it through, there will be a multi-day break where it's mostly dry in most of California and maybe a little bit longer than that. So much needed, much deserved, and it's about time. So uh, I will be taking, I would hesitate to say taking a break. I will be going and trying to frantically catch up on all the other work uh, that is urgently due uh, that I have neglected over the past week, such as the challenge of a public-facing scientist communicator, is that all of the work that I'm actually uh, on the books for producing is unrelated to what I spend a lot of my time doing. Uh, therein lies the funding challenge. But anyway, uh, I wanted to summarize the events that have unfolded over the past week or so in California, sort of what happened, the impacts that we've seen now that most of them have now already occurred and are in the past, and sort of with the broader context for these events, some of the, the conversations that have been swirling around uh, regarding what we've seen, and then also briefly uh, touching on what might be coming down the pike, because it does look like, although there is going to be, again, a, a, a multi-day dry spell and perhaps more like a week of mostly, mostly dry conditions, give or take, after that, it might be off to the races again. There are already signs, 7 to 10 days out, of another active El Nino-like pattern across California and the northeastern Pacific Ocean, which could bring yet more heavy rainfall to some places that have seen more rain than they usually see in an entire season uh, just over the past week. So that could be uh, more of something that isn't needed right now. But we, uh, I'll cross that bridge later uh, when we get closer to it, probably early next week is when I'm thinking about having my next live office hour, in which case I would definitely talk about that then. Uh, so uh, I'll qu I think I'm going to start by sharing the screen to show a little bit of radar and satellite imagery. Uh, some, some current stuff. I won't spend as much time doing that today because there isn't quite as much going on, although there is still something uh, that's fairly interesting out there, and I think it's worth um, I think it's worth sharing with folks. I'm going to start with radar. Folks will be familiar with this uh, this imagery by now. Uh, here is where the window might be a little bit uh, too big, and I need to resize it. So bear with me for just a minute uh, as I resize that window. That was not what I was planning to do. Sorry, folks. I do not want to remove that window. Let me see how this is appearing for everybody. Yeah, there is. it is getting cut off. So just bear with me for one moment while I resize the window to match the actual size of the screen that we have got. Here we go, making progress, making progress, almost there, uh, almost there, and then I just need to size this to see, okay. And here we are, I believe. There we go, although that's not showing the scale anymore. I'm just trying to get both the labels and the scale on the same plot. Uh, Here we go, that seems better. All right, I think that's uh, that's probably close enough. Close enough for now. Um, so uh, I'm gonna zoom in, this is the San Francisco Bay Area radar site. Of course, we've seen a lot of it uh, in recent days. 
And there is, as everybody in the Bay Area experienced today, yet another significant uh, storm uh, that went through primarily earlier. Uh, you can see there isn't a really well-defined cold front. There is something. It's sort of down here by now. So it's already passed through the Bay Area, and it's now going through uh, the, the San Joaquin Valley, uh, San Luis Obispo County. Definitely still some spokes of heavy showers and thunderstorms behind it. This initial band earlier today brought uh, lightning, some small hail, and torrential downpours to much of the Bay Area. So it was not a very prolonged storm. Rainfall totals haven't been huge, but it was very intense when it was occurring. Uh, and this is uh, continuing now as these bands uh, move down the coast. Let's take a look at the, the San Joaquin Valley, see what things look like there. You can kind of see this is a this is a pretty respectable uh, band of, of precipitation about to move into the San Joaquin Valley. So it doesn't actually doesn't look quite as intense as it was when it was in the Bay Area, but there still should be some decent rain out of this for much of the San Joaquin. And then let's take a look at the Vandenberg Air Force Base. This is more what it looked like when it moved through the Bay Area. So notice I'm going to zoom in and notice this uh, this intense band of of convective precipitation. It's not very wide, but it's uh, it's it's got some pretty robust uh, downpours associated with it. In fact, it looks like it might be re-intensifying a bit as it comes into Morro Bay and the Central Coast. Uh, would not be surprised to see some lightning or even a water spout or two uh, associated with this line as it comes through once again. And and you know as this continues eastward. This is going to bring a short but potentially heavy burst of precipitation once again, yet again, for the much of Southern California. So as this moves eastward, this is probably going to make progress uh, down the Santa Barbara coast, uh, Ventura County coast, and into LA County, and maybe even a bit further south and east. So all of the areas that were drenched during this multi-day storm event in recent days are going to get briefly soaked again by this. Now again, widespread flooding not anticipated because the system is not going to linger. This is the opposite of the system we just saw in that sense, and that's going to move through very quickly, maybe only an hour or two of rain. On the other hand, downpours are pretty intense. There are some isolated thunderstorms, so given how saturated conditions are, I would not be too surprised to hear of an isolated instance or two of some renewed flash flooding or mud uh, mudslides or debris flows anywhere from the central coast into LA County or maybe even point south and east. So not widespread, but this is sort of the last gasp of the current storm sequence. It's a sneaky, small, relatively weak, but convectively active and therefore containing uh, very heavy downpours locally kind of system that's moving through overnight tonight into early tomorrow morning across the south, far southeastern part of California. But once this goes through, that should be it for a while. in terms of uh, significant precipitation. Uh, and then I'll, I'm gonna share uh, briefly uh, some satellite imagery uh, in addition to this, just to give the bigger picture. And just so you can see uh, that the, um, this is, this is uh, weather model data, but the satellite imagery here Here's the big picture, uh, and as you can see, uh, this system, uh, it looks pretty on satellite. You can see that convective band, that arcing across, but look how narrow it is. I mean, this convective band is maybe 50 miles wide. Uh, it gets a little bit wider over the Central Valley, but you know, along the coast, this is nowhere near as huge as the storm we saw over the weekend. There's some popcorn showers, I said thunderstorms behind it, and the cold core, the unstable air mass behind it. But generally speaking, this rain will be fewer, uh, spaced fewer and further apart uh, as time goes on as the systems moves through. But again, still got to get through Southern California. There will be a period of down, brief downpours and maybe a thunderstorm or two that could cause some uh, secondary problems given just how sopping wet everything is down there with the flood cleanup and the mudslide cleanup continuing. Speaking of uh, cleanup, Continuing, I also wanted to briefly show the power outage map. Remember, this is this is the map where uh, earlier this week there were hundreds of thousands of customers out, equating to perhaps as many as two million people in, in northern and central California. Well, fortunately, that number has come way down. Although it still is notable uh, that there are still all between seventy-five and eighty thousand customers out. Again, that corresponds to about two point five 
people per customer. So that's still a couple hundred thousand people in northern and central California who don't have power in the wake of these storms. These outages that remain are mostly concentrated in Mendocino, Sonoma, and Monterey counties. And that pretty much corresponds with where some of the strongest winds occurred uh, with, with this event. And also, uh, essentially areas that have a lot of uh, smaller cities and towns that are in heavily wooded areas that have a power infrastructure that's quite susceptible to uh, problems when trees come down and when branches come down in those settings. So uh, just wanted to highlight that, that it's actually vastly improved and yet there are still a lot of people who are out of power considering that we are now on day three or four for some of those people depending on uh, who uh, and where you are. And then the last thing I want to show uh, today graphically is uh, the outlook for what's to come. So I'm actually doing this a little bit backwards. I'm going through all the visuals first and then I'm going to come back and talk about what we've already observed and what and, and uh, the context of what might be next. Um, so there's this, I'm going to zoom out to uh, the North Pacific so you get the big picture view. And I'm going to choose what is arguably the slightly better of the two global modeling ensembles, the European model ensemble, to show what I want to show with this. Uh, this is going back in time a bit. This still goes back to Sunday, so you can see the progression of the, the, of the big uh, bomb cyclone, low pressure uh, system, late Sunday into early Monday uh, in, in Northern California. And uh, you can see as uh, time goes on, uh, that system moved into Southern California, and then this little secondary system that we're dealing with right now slid down the back side of that trough. You can kind of see that. I'm sort of toggling back and forth in time so you can watch the trajectory. This is essentially uh, right now. Uh, we, are, we are here. This is right over the Bay Area. As I mentioned, this is going to head into Southern California and bring some overnight showers and isolated thunderstorms, so there could be some downpours. But once that moves through, things calm down. In fact, we get some weak ridging over the weekend along the west coast. We will need it, but uh, we're going to get it, fortunately. So unlike a, a more dire storm sequence scenario where it just keeps coming without any breaks, we're going to get a real break uh, this weekend into early next week. Now, what happens after that? So now we're looking out towards next Tuesday and Wednesday, and things start to change a bit. Uh, where this active pattern you can see starts to break more progress across the eastern Pacific, especially as we head in toward the end of next week, Friday, Saturday. So this is about 10, 7 to 10 days from now. And what the global models are showing is, on the one hand, uh, high latitude blocking. So see this ridge up over the, bar uh, up over the, the Chukchi Sea uh, in the Arctic. So Arctic ridging. And then a, a, another a zonal extension of the jet stream, so ridging in the far west Pacific, but troughing in the east, that classic signal that we look out for. And this is a very favorable pattern heading into uh, the second half of February for another very active spell in California. What I want to bring up is the jet, st jet stream map. Again, this is that jet stream. You see the bomb, uh, the, 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 the bombogenesis going on off the coast on Sunday in California, that very low, low pressure area, you see it getting down into the 970s uh, millibars, right in that favorable position just north of that jet streak. So the jet streak, by the way, when I, when I use that, it's not a typo in blog posts from jet stream. It's a region where the jet stream is locally much stronger than an adjacent region. So here you can see the jet streak over the weekend aligned right over Southern California was an excess of 140 to 150 knots. So that's uh, 150 to 160 plus miles an hour. Very strong. But look to the west. It's there, but it's weaker. O only, only I say, uh, in the 110s, 120s of miles per hour. And then again to the east, the same thing is true. So this big purple blob is a jet streak. This purple and orange and, and, and a pink blob out here is an even stronger jet streak. And this was the pattern that we had over the weekend. Sometimes the streaks the changes in jet curvature and strength are what can allow for the kinds of upward vertical motion that allow for the rapid deepening of low pressure systems like happened this weekend. So this is back in time again. We go, we're, we're back in time on Monday now, uh, back in time on Tuesday. This is sort of when the peak of the rain was in Southern California, early Tuesday. 
And you can see the system moved on. There's this little additional mini jet streak on the backside of the low. That's what we're seeing right now today, but that's not nearly as impressive as what we saw before. And then over the weekend, uh, the jet stream, you can see this, this, this short wave ridge uh, as, the, as the jet stream finally uh, west to just southwest of California is almost absent. In fact, it's way south. It's present to the west and present to the east, but over California this weekend, not much going on with the jet stream. But look at what's starting to lurk out there over the western Pacific. Yet another strong, robust looking uh, East Asia jet extension sometimes a precursor to active weather in California. The one in December was a false start, but the one just now in late January and early February was absolutely not. This one looks like it's going to be uh, another one that actually goes all the way. Uh, as you can see, we're again, talking about 10 days out, all of this starts to uh, make, uh, make headway all the way to the coast. In fact, we then have a jet stream across the Pacific that might be uh, consolidated enough to bring major storms back into Southern and Central California. And the jet stream is aligned over Central Baja, California. That's really far south in a classic El Nino signature. So, uh, oh, and this, this is the, the 12 Zulu run. It doesn't even go any further. I'll go back in time a bit so you can see uh, to an earlier run to see how this finishes. Uh, it doesn't look as strong, right, uh, than in some of the earlier frames, but some of that is just because the picture becomes fuzzier uh, farther out. And the important thing to remember is that what we're seeing is that the Pacific jet stream is making it all the way across the Pacific in this deep subtropics, classic El Nino pattern, and is in fact stronger in the eastern half of the Pacific than in the western half. That is a, a notably significant pattern. Uh, and what it ends up indicating is that what we were likely to see is uh, an unusual advection of subtropical moisture right back into central and southern California once again. So if we, uh, well, I think I might skip showing the precipitation plots at this point because to be quite honest, they don't mean a lot at this early stage. Uh, the good news is there's gonna be a break. This is not gonna be an unbroken storm chain. So that is definitely one of, the, one of the characteristics of all of our worst case flood scenarios in California are these unbroken chains of storms that just go on for weeks. This won't be that. So that is the good news. But the, the, what I did wanna highlight is that we're already seeing signs like we saw a couple weeks ago that about 10 days from now, we may enter another major storm cycle period that would be most likely to favor central and southern California. Now keep in mind, Many places in Southern California just saw historic rainfall and are now at or above their entire seasonal average for a typical year or winter just from the storms we've seen so far. So if we get another major storm cycle, that is going to get interesting. And for now, that's probably all uh, we can say about it, uh, except to say that I'm glad that we're getting this break in between. If we weren't getting this break, we would be having a somewhat different and more urgent conversation right now, but it does look like we're going to get that break in the meantime. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and you're gonna see my face again. Um, all right. And I think the what I wanted to do next is, as I mentioned, just give some summative thoughts to what's happened recently. And then, as usual, I will take a look at the questions in just a couple of moments. Uh, you know, what, we, what we've just seen in California was in some ways a historic storm. It was one of the deepest uh, low pressure systems near the Bay Area and one of the fastest deepening ones uh, that we've seen. I'm not quite sure it is singularly the most extreme, but it's up there in the top five uh, extreme low pressure uh, events near the Bay Area in the past century or so. So that is a historically notable event. It didn't necessarily bring the absolute worst windstorm uh, uh, in terms of the gusts at the surface that we've ever seen. Uh, but again, it did bring major wind damage to places that haven't seen it as much recently. And the power outages that resulted were very extensive. In fact, on one of my live streams, I was uh, mentioning that the California Independent System Operator, which oversees California's electrical grid, had issued a statewide transmission emergency for reasons that at the moment were unclear. Uh, to be clear, there is currently no uh, transmission emergency, but 
at the time, we were sort of pondering why that might be. It turns out that there were so many discontinuous and discrete outages that there was some concern about the integrity of the overall grid because there were so many small to medium scale outages that it was getting difficult to stabilize the load, apparently. So that's my understanding of what happened there. So it was a significant event, and PG&E, the utility that provides uh, electricity and gas services for most of Northern California, uh, said that it was one of the top three uh, storm damage events that they've ever had to deal with. Now, that's not a very quantitative statement, but it's consistent, I think, broadly with what the data show about the, the level and, and, and the extent, spatially, of power outages. And I think the fact that there's still probably a couple hundred thousand people in Northern California without power days later is a testament to how extensive the damage has been and how long it's taking to fix uh, all of it. Uh, my apologies if you're in day four or five without power. Probably not uh, the only time that's happened to you in some of those more rural locations over the past two or three years. Last winter, we saw these multi-day kinds of power outages as well. But of course, the main event in many ways was in Southern California, where the Los Angeles County in particular saw truly historic levels of rainfall. And ironically, I think one of the most extremely anomalous data points actually came from the rain gauge on the roof at the Atmospheric Science Department at UCLA on UCLA campus, where over 12 inches of rain fell in a 48-hour period, which shatters all previous records, I believe, for the 48-hour period at that rain gauge. And that rain gauge has, has been there or uh, very close to there for the past 90 plus years. So that's saying a lot. Now, other parts of LA saw lots and lots of rain as well. In fact, in many cases, uh, it was a historically significant event, although notably at most of the official sites, it was not the most intense 24 or 48 hour rain event on record, although it did come within the top five for some spots. So just a testament to the fact that although it was exceptional, it wasn't so far outside of historical experience, at least on a broad city or county level, that we should point to weathering the event as a great sign that we're, we're, we're fully prepared for the kinds of extreme rain events that are going to come California's way in a warming climate. I am very glad that there was not a, catastrophe, a flood catastrophe in Southern California, but it's also not that surprising that there wasn't in the broader context of the way this rain fell, which is to say it was heavy, but it mostly wasn't torrential in, in the sense that it, it was sustained moderate to heavy rain for almost two days, but there generally weren't too many hours where the rate was uh, unworkable. And although there were hundreds of mudslides in Southern California, and some of them were damaging, there were definitely some houses that were destroyed and lots of vehicles that were destroyed, as far as I know, nobody in California died uh, or was severely injured from uh, debris flows, mudslides, or floods during this event, which is partly a testament to effective preparedness, but I also think it's a testament to the fact that this event was, in many cases, one that remained just under uh, a bunch of really critical thresholds. The LA River was not seriously threatening to overflow its banks, for example, uh, which is something that theoretically could occur with rain rates that were higher than what we just observed, or if a storm like this had come on the heels of another storm of similar magnitude. And if that sounds implausible, well, that's sort of what we're looking at. And when we do talk about these kinds of plausible worst case scenarios in the context of say, uh, the arc storm uh, scenario or, or the science that goes into that. And I've talked in previous sessions about how there's a lot of misinformation swirling about that. But I just want to point out that Los Angeles, as, as historic as the rainfall was and as disruptive as the flooding and mudslides have been, I would argue that they have been more disruptive than destructive. And I don't think it would be fair to characterize what just occurred as a catastrophe or as a catastrophic flood, even on a local level, let alone on a state level. Many parts of the state, by the way, didn't see any significant flooding at all. From this event because this was a relatively regional precipitation extreme from about Ventura County into Orange County. Uh, and so, I mean, that's good news. Nobody wants to see a catastrophe. But the only reason I raise this is that this was not the worst that Mother Nature is capable of throwing at Southern California, especially in the context of a warming climate. A warming climate does make events like what we just saw more likely, and probably there was a, an extra inch or two of rain from this event, uh, by the way, that wouldn't have occurred 
had the climate not warmed as much uh, as it has in the past century. And, you know, think of it this way. In a typical winter, one to two inch rain event in, in Los Angeles would be a notable storm unto itself. So if climate change that we've already seen increased the increment by which the storm produced this extreme precipitation by an inch or two, and I'm sort of doing this math based on, say, the UCLA rain gauge that got, I think, between 12 and 13 inches of rain, and I'm just sort of doing the math, the simple math. Well, the, the most likely amount by which global warming made this event, at, as it has made similar events more intense, is somewhere between 5 and 15%. So let's call it 10%, uh, because that's in the middle. And when you get 12 to 13 inches of rain, that's an extra inch to two inches uh, that you're going to get out of a storm of this magnitude. And that's not trivial. Uh, but imagine again a, a future event where it's another 10 to, you know, 5 to 15 percent wetter and we get an additional 1 to 2 inches on top of something like this. Then you can start to see how these effects are additive, in some cases nonlinear, because in this storm there were probably storm drains and culverts and creeks that overflowed that wouldn't have had there been 10 to 15 percent less rainfall. But there were also probably a number of systems, hillsides that didn't slide down the mountain, roads that didn't flood, that would have flooded had there been an additional 5 to 15 percent uh, precipitation relative to what we saw. And that is the path that we're on with another degree or two of warming over the next few decades. And so that is, you know, something that we really should be thinking about. In, in the context of events. Now, again, to reiterate, even in, even absent climate change, ignoring that for a moment, this still wasn't the worst storm that Southern California could possibly experience. So even assuming there was no global warming and no increase in extreme precipitation events at all, we probably should be thinking about much larger events even than this one uh, in the context of what we really uh, could potentially be uh, facing in a plausible worst case scenario. So I'm thrilled that there wasn't a flood catastrophe at this event, but also there shouldn't have been. And so it would have been even worse news if there had been, because this wasn't the kind of event that should plausibly have caused one. So the fact that there wasn't one is both reassuring, but also shouldn't uh, encourage us to rest on our, laurel, our laurels and pat ourselves on the back too much because this probably wasn't an adequate event to truly test at the extreme upper end the kinds of systems that we're really concerned about in a, in a, in a real quote-unquote mega flood scenario. So fortunately this wasn't one. Fortunately it's not turning into one because we're going to get our much needed break. Uh, there could be additional flood risk in seven to ten days. Stay tuned. But again, the fact that we're getting the break that we're going to get over, the, over starting tomorrow and lasting at least five or six days is good news and will help mitigate at least partially the effects of whatever comes next after that. So that's the good news. Uh, and the other you know, piece of this is a question about, you know, is El Nino playing a role here? Uh, and the, 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 you know, the, the answer is yes that El Nino makes a strong, sub, uh, sub, strong Pacific jet stream at lower latitudes, maybe dipping down into the subtropics and becoming enhanced across uh, the, the portion of the northeastern Pacific just southwest of Southern California. It tends to make that segment of the jet stream stronger, uh, preferentially, and that is precisely the kind of pattern that leads to the storms that we've seen this past week and the kind of storm cycle that we might be looking at again in about 10 days. So El Nino doesn't cause specific storms. It never has. It never will. It, it doesn't really make sense to, to assign ultimate causality to El Nino. But like other things, it tilts the odds. Did global warming cause the storm? No. Did El Nino cause the storm? No. Did any single process cause this storm? No. So it's sort of a nonsensical scientific question in that sense. It's a poorly framed question. The question really is, are storms like this, including the one we just experienced, uh, do they, are, are they wetter than they would have been without climate change? Yes. Does El Nino make the kind of storm, that, storm sequence that we just saw more likely than in a year that we don't have a strong east-based El Nino pattern? Yes, it, it tilts the odds. And when you've got both of these factors tilting the odds in the same direction as we did this year, it's perhaps not super surprising that we're seeing the sequence of events that we are. 
Uh, now, in any given year, other factors can be more dominant, right? So tilting the odds, if there's some other factor or factors, countervailing factors, uh, tilting the odds in the other direction, uh, then you won't necessarily see this. Uh, but the, the, the bottom line is that when we see events like this, there are links, uh, there are links to climate change, even if it's not the only thing that matters. And there are links to El Nino, even though it's not the only thing that matters. And so we need to be able to hold both of those uh, thoughts in our head simultaneously, because the reality is that there's always a complex interplay of factors that, that yield uh, any extreme weather event. There's never a single cause. But when you start to, to stack up those tilts and the odds and weight uh, the upper end of the scale more and more, uh, then you start to see events like this more and more, and you start to see events greater than this, at least uh, on, on, on some occasions. So that's sort of how I think about it. That's really how climate science operates these days in thinking about the way the world works. Uh, in a certain sense, all weather events are changed due to a warming climate because the boundary conditions are different than they would otherwise be, but exactly how they're changed and how, how consequential that difference in weather events is from event to event varies. There are probably some events that are not as extreme as they would have been had the climate not warmed. But on balance, when you look at extreme precipitation events, extreme heat events, they are more severe than they would have been uh, to different degrees uh, than had they occurred in a cooler climate. So uh, that's the world we live in today. Uh, and uh, stay tuned for more discussions about that in future sessions. I think that gets me through my monologue portion. I've already talked a lot this week, but I do want to talk, look at questions. Uh, one piece uh, that seems to be good news is that the connection seems pretty good. Audio and video seem pretty solid from my perspective. I haven't noticed any interruptions in stream health. I haven't gotten any advisories from the YouTube server, so that's a good sign. I'll assume it's good unless somebody tells me otherwise. All right, the, the first uh, real uh, question is from Mark. Anything to say about the effect of the recurrent tropical tap atmospheric river on the shift of El Nino phase? Uh, I think this may be referring to the fact that El Nino is now, although it's still strong, it is probably on its last legs. And there may, the model is suggesting a very rapid transition toward a significant La Nina event this spring. Well, the reality is is that the, uh, the atmospheric response is a bit lagged. So we've still got another month or two of El Nino-like atmospheric uh, forcing probably before El Nino falls apart. So I think for the rest of what is traditionally rainy season, it's gonna be El Nino flavored more likely than not. And that's reflected also in just what, what looks like we're gonna see over the, the next couple of weeks with another uh, enhanced uh, East Pacific jet stream and active storm pattern in about 10 days. So the spring might be a slightly different story uh, with, with the transition to La Nina. So stay tuned for that. We'll see how quickly that occurs. Uh, but in general, this is going to be a weird transition to La Nina because the models are adamant that there will be a transition toward a significant La Nina, meaning cooler than average temperatures in the eastern tropical Pacific. Once again, uh, just to remind everybody, El Nino means warmer than average temperatures in the eastern tropical Pacific. But they're also indicating that the rest of the global oceans outside of the tropics, so except for this cool blob in the tropical East Pacific Ocean off the coast of Peru, the rest of the oceans will remain roasting warm, uh, potentially record warm, much as they were last year. So we see this flip to La Nina, and now we're going to get to see what it looks like in a year with the oceans are record warm everywhere but the tropics in the Pacific. And that is a completely different uh, connection pattern than what we saw uh, last year uh, with warm tropics and warm extratropics. Well, now we're going to have cool tropics and the warm extratropics continuing. One thing that might be a recipe for is a very serious Atlantic hurricane season. Uh, I don't normally talk about that too much on this channel, but it's so striking that I can't not bring it up. But up beyond that, I guess we'll just have to see what happens. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. A question from Zoya. Uh, hey, uh, looking into the public health impacts of atmospheric rivers in California beyond the direct deaths associated with these flooding events, there seems to be one study on the subject from 2018. Any thoughts? Uh, I know I, I know which study you're looking at. 
uh, and I think that may be the only one that does so in, in, in direct terms. But what I would also encourage uh, you to look at then in this context, really there are two pieces to this. Uh, there are the sort of the, the cumulative uh, societal crises uh, in places. Last winter, for example, uh, when the Pajaro River flooded uh, in, in, in Monterey County, I think that was Monterey County, yeah, that's Monterey County, uh, there's just some long-lasting uh, socioeconomic uh, impacts from that, and we know that when people are stressed socioeconomically, health outcomes are poorer. Uh, and although it's not, I don't know how much it's been studied, when you live uh, in a structure that's been recently flooded and it's not adequately re remediated, people start getting issues with mold and things like that, that can actually be very poor for your individual health, that indoor air quality can go down. So I'm not an expert in that. I don't honestly know the literature there. But the other thing that I would point you to is the the valley fever perspective. So this is that that that, that fungal pathogen that can be a, become a serious illness in humans and is actually be, becoming much more prevalent throughout the Southwest, including Central and Southern California in recent decades. There are a lot more consequential human cases. I personally know several people who have had it uh, or who still have it because some of these folks uh, are sort of living uh, with, sort of at, a, at an uneasy truce with this illness because you don't always uh, get rid of it. It just sort of continues to live in your body. And it's an airborne uh, fungal spore that's a soil-borne pathogen there is scientific evidence suggesting that cycling between extremely wet and extremely dry conditions is precisely what makes this a, a bigger problem. Because of course you need the wetter conditions for the fungal spores to, to grow, uh, but at least when it's wet they tend to stay in the soil. So if you have really damp wet soil, uh, it's not really blowing around easily, it's not aerosolizing easily. But then once you, after a wet cycle you get back into a dry cycle and things get dusty, and when you get those wind storms, that starts to get lofted and people breathe it in and can sometimes become ill. So the valley fever perspective on atmospheric rivers is an interesting one. There is some literature on this recently, and that is a major public health threat that I think is widely underrecognized in California. This is something uh, that is probably going to become an increasingly big story in, in, in future years as it continues to spread north and west in the southwest, and it's already present now, at least in the su southern half of California, and especially in the Central Valley and in the southeastern desert regions where dust is more common. But it might become so elsewhere, depending on changes in climate, particularly during drought years that follow wet years. And this is interesting and somewhat concerning because what we find in California, again, getting back to this notion of increasing hydroclimate whiplash, is increasingly wide swings between extremely wet and extremely dry conditions, which is going to be a challenge both from a wildfire perspective, because you keep getting that growth of vegetation during the wet periods, but then you dry it out and then burn it during the increasingly dry periods, but also for uh, soil-borne pathogens like valley fever, because it's you, you get those wet periods where it grows a lot, and then you get the dry periods that follow, where it gets aerosolized and people breathe it in when it gets dusty. So that's another major public health consideration. It's not necessarily specific to atmospheric rivers, but it's certainly related to them because California kind of lives and dies by atmospheric rivers. And on the wet side of things, uh, wet years are essentially years where we get a lot of strong atmospheric rivers and dry years are years where we get a few too few atmospheric rivers. So in that sense, that's a big part of the story there. Oh yeah, a few folks have noticed that uh, that the weather has is, it's, it's got a lot colder. There is actually some snow on the highest Bay Area peaks even, so Mount Hamilton uh, is getting some accumulating snowfall. So clearly snow is down to lower elevations in the foothills too, down to 2,000 feet in the Sierra foothills, maybe even a bit lower locally. So there are some lower elevation accumulations, which is good. It's good to get some snow finally on the ground. I don't think it's a huge amount of snow at lower elevations, but uh, usually this happens at least a few times a year, and so finally we're getting some, uh, since I don't think that's really happened yet at that elevation this year. Uh, yeah, Joyce mentions that 2,400 feet in Grass Valley, it's snowing, which is on the lower side of things.
Stephen asks if in a future session I can talk about the research that I do. Uh, and yes, of course, uh, I, I do tend to have sessions that are more focused on research, either my own or the broader body of uh, extreme weather and climate research. Um, I try and blend it a little bit with the, the, the conversations I have about the weather. In fact, some of the things I've told you about climate change today are directly drawn from the research that I've done at UCLA and NCAR. Uh, but yes, I, I will have some more research-focused sessions in the future, uh, for sure. Question from William. Has all this moisture streaming into the West Coast helped the Colorado River drainage and put water behind the Hoover Dam, or was all the moisture squeezed out by the mountains to the west? Uh, well, it's never all or nothing. There has been some decent snow in the lower Colorado Basin, but in this case, this really, this is the classic kind of event where a lot of this water does get squeezed out uh, in, in by the mountains uh, to the west in California. So there, there was some good boost to, to some portions of the Colorado Basin, but it wasn't nearly as substantial as what occurred over coastal California. So of course, all the water that falls in the transverse ranges of California and in the Sierra, all of that ends up uh, going, uh, well, at least on the west side of the Sierra, uh, into the Central Valley watersheds, uh, or in the case of the transverse ranges out to the Pacific Ocean directly. So most of the moisture was here, but there was some. There was some snow accumulation across the lower Colorado watershed. Yeah, several people have pointed out, and I didn't want to, I, I did want to emphasize this. I've talked about this in, on, on uh, previous sessions. Uh, that this was a deadly storm, um, and, and to my knowledge, most or all of the deaths occurred due to falling trees. So this, so actually, this this storm was deadlier from the wind damage. Uh, but I, it's possible that I have missed something, and that there 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 were flood related deaths probably in Southern California. If that happened, I, I don't know. So perhaps folks can correct me. But to my knowledge, the fatalities that I was aware of were actually from falling trees. So from the the wind, primarily the wind component of the storm. And there, and there were at least several. I, I don't know what the total is uh, right now. Let's see here. All right, continuing to scan down here. Uh, various folks relating some rainfall totals that are very impressive and, and the fact that a lot of local roads are still closed due to some residual flooding or mudslides. Um, not, not surprising given the magnitude of, of what has happened. A question from Max, uh, do I consider the storm that's currently passing through LA County tonight to be a part of this most recent atmospheric river event? Uh, no, it's not an atmospheric river, and it's really kind of a distinct little system. It is a, a short wave or, 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 a, or sort of a little uh, spin in the atmosphere, a little low pressure system that is falling down the backside of, maybe you could consider it the same trough associated with it, but the same uh, trough versus ridge, say, so these are these large scale features in the atmosphere that describe flow patterns, so the trough would sort of look like this in a, in a north-south map orientation, uh, and, the, and the trough would, would look like that, much as you'd expect, like a depression in the ground, meaning like a trough. Uh, those are features, storms sort of pass through them. So multiple storms might go through a single, a single trough because the jet stream, this translation speed is, of course, as I was mentioning, 150, 160 miles an hour. So the long wave troughs might move at only tens of miles an hour translationally, but the jet stream is moving at 150 miles an hour through the trough, and so you know, it pushes storms through it faster than it translates. So this is sort of the third system, actually, that we've seen cycle through the current East Pacific trough, and it's the weakest 
smallest and fastest moving of them. So it's all part of the same uh, large scale pattern, but it is a distinct system and is not part of the atmospheric river, nor is it uh, an atmospheric river in itself. Yeah, Bob mentions that as a veterinarian that he saw uh, many cases of valley fever in dogs in Southern California. Now, not so much in cats, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's, it's kind of a, a opportunistic pathogen in many ways, and it, and it, and it definitely uh, can affect uh, a, a fairly wide range of species. To my knowledge, it's limited to mammals, but um, there's a lot of mammals out there, and uh, we're one of them, so... Elisa mentions that Santiago Peak in the Santa Anas has some snow, uh, also some snow in the peaks of San Diego and Orange Counties. Yeah, the, the snow levels really dropped after this last wave, which is another indication that we're no longer seeing the atmospheric river. This is the cold and unstable air mass behind the atmospheric river with some different spokes of vorticity or, or spin in the atmosphere uh, sliding down the backside of that trough and bringing additional bouts of showers and thunderstorms, but they're much colder. Uh, than the initial system, which had a very strong subtropical influence. Uh, somebody mentions that in Morro Bay there was just a tornado warning. Uh, let me uh, let me take a look at this. Uh, I'm not seeing a tornado warning uh, yet. Let me see if I can verify that. I'll show the radar either way, since there is something certainly something interesting going on there. But, um, okay, there was a tornado warning, uh, briefly, uh, yeah, it included, um, uh, Paso Robles, uh, all right, so let me bring up the radar, so that's, that's, that's an interesting thing to take a look at, uh, I need to change what you're seeing to back to radar. Okay, let's dig into this. Uh, so here's this line. Uh, so here we go. Here's Morro Bay uh, and this cell that just moved through. So this statement, by the way, is no longer a tornado warning. It's a special weather statement. It's a lesser statement. There's also a special marine warning, presumably for water spouts. But there was, in fact, a short-lived tornado warning issued uh, a little while ago. And let me zoom in and show you what why. Uh, let's, let's see what the weather service saw here when they issued that. Okay. So yeah, I can see exactly what was going on. So let me pause this. So here's, oh, oh, I need to go back in time, uh, um, and step backwards. So while I was talking, uh, yep. Okay. So if you look at this circulation here, you can see that on the right side of your screen, so this is the typical radar reflectivity that you'd see, uh, uh, on the TV screen, but on the right here uh, is the, the the red and green, and I apologize if you're colorblind, this probably isn't going to show up very well, but uh, I don't have control over this. Uh, this is called the couplet, so here, it, this green area and this red area immediately adjacent, this suggests that there is rotation on a pretty small scale. Uh, so this means that when we look at this intense little little storm cell, uh, that there is generally uh, in this vicinity, somewhere in here, uh, the potential for a water spout or a tornado. And you can see this is sort of in that, that curved region of what might actually be these. These look like they're almost like little mini supercells here. Uh, so this band is pretty intense as it's coming through. But look what happens if I step through this. Um, and I want you to focus. Uh, let me draw a, a line focus in this area as I step backward and forward. Um, so you can see, whoops, uh, it starts out, there's pretty strong rotation. It comes on right near Morro Bay. So there might've been a water spout or a weak tornado that just uh, came on shore. Look at that, right as it goes over Morro Bay, it, uh, it gets a little more intense. There's another little couplet down here. 
with the one up. And so this is when the tornado warning was issued. Yeah, these actually get stronger. There might have been a tornado. Well, maybe we'll have to see what happened. And this would have been pretty close. And then uh, as it goes eastward, you can see that the signature becomes weaker. And then the, the warning was uh, retracted as that happened. However, still, this is a very intense line of showers and thunderstorms right now. Um, I'm just trying to get this to animate again. Let me see if I go to a different site and come back to this one if it uh, get a nice view of the... All right, I'm gonna go back. Yep, okay, here we go. So we saw that move over uh, Morro Bay a few minutes ago. Are there other features like that in here? Uh, yes, in fact, there's another potential little spin. There could be a water spout down in that area. Look at that couplet. Uh, maybe something uh, up in this vicinity too. So there's a number of candidates for potential water spouts. All this whole line is moving uh, toward the central coast. So again, torrential rainfall at minimum, maybe some lightning and maybe even a brief additional water spout or tornadic spin up. I, and again, this line's gonna move across much of Southern California into the evening. So uh, th there could be some more of these short-lived tornado warnings, uh, depending on how that goes. So never a dull moment uh, this week in California weather, that's that's for sure. So, um, all right, so I'm gonna stop sharing that again. Take one more look at the comments. Uh, The Brad Walls says, uh, comments, wondering if you've ever noticed that the local weather reports tend to downplay the heavy storms and overplay the lighter ones. I would figure there's some universal consensus for the info. You know, I actually have noticed this, uh, where some of the hazards associated with the truly dangerous storms are really kind of emphasized as being like, oh, it's just another rainstorm, just like the rest. And then sometimes, you know, we have, you know, Doppler, mega Doppler storm watch 5,000 for some, you know, a pretty run of the mill rain event. Uh, you know, I think that speaks to the, 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 the idea that weather coverage on, on broadcast television is actually a pretty good uh, money maker in the sense that it actually consistently draws audiences more so than other kinds of coverage. In fact, I know for a fact that some of the major newspapers in California, their weather and climate coverage actually is an integral part of uh, these media organizations because it draws in a lot of viewers and a lot of readers. And so in that context, I think it is, you know, there is maybe some incentive to, to, to cover even pretty minor weather events, you know, uh, pretty intensively. I'm not quite sure why some of the really big events get downplayed a little bit, but I also think it's uh, seen as, as, as not wanting to sound the alarm and then, you know, be the boy who cried wolf in some ways. So I'm speculating here. I don't really have data to show this, but you know, the question was whether I've noticed this, and I, and I do have some sense of that. Some networks, you know, do this more than others. And the nice thing about you know broadcast meteorology on TV is that there are often individual personalities. You know, there are some folks who are great and who have formal science backgrounds. And so, you know, uh, I work with a lot of broadcast meteorologists actually from around the country. Um, you know, I was just meeting with a bunch of them up at Operation Sierra Storm just this a couple of weeks ago. Feels like it was about three months ago, but it's actually only been two weeks, I think, maybe, I don't know. I'm a little discombobulated these days. But my point is, uh, is that, you know, for most people, by the way, the still, the, the, the most common point of entry for weather and climate science is uh, local news media coverage of day-to-day -day, uh, events. Uh, and to now, uh, in some cases, it's a smartphone weather apps. So uh, the, the local news networks actually have a lot of uh, power in, in, and a lot of, I think, responsibility to do it, you know, to do, to do this well, because they are. Uh, and this puts a lot of pressure, by the way, on individual broadcast meteorologists who sometimes tend to become the de facto station scientist. It's quite likely that in many cases they're the only person in the studio uh, who might have some sort of formal scientific background, you know, a bachelor's degree or even a, an advanced degree in meteorology or, or sciences or something. 
And so, you know, when there's an earthquake, when there's a wildfire, uh, often, uh, you know, the producers and the directors will lean heavily uh, on, on these folks. So it's, uh, it can be a tough job. Uh, and there's also pressure, you know, ultimately, um, television is ratings driven. And so sometimes I think there may be some incentive for, for, you know, a lot of the time, you know, you could say in California, do we really need an evening weather segment when it's June and there's uh, May gray, June gloom, you know, along the coast and it's 80 degrees inland, uh, you know, every day. Uh, that's, I'm exaggerating a little bit. And this is, you know, this is sort of a plot point uh, in, you know, in, um, in the movie Anchorman is that, you know, what, what does it mean to be a meteorologist in San Diego? Well, this week it means something a lot more interesting than, than is portrayed in that movie. I'm not using that movie as a, as a point of reference for accurate, uh, uh, accurate representation of broadcast meteorology, but I think there is, there is a kernel of truth in this notion that in some places, you know, it, it's just kind of, it's, it's almost a, a, an inside joke to show the weather segment, where it's yet again, you know, uh, fog along the coast, sunny inland, r rinse and repeat for the next, you know, four to six weeks. But then you do get periods like the present one where, you know, San Diego, one of the first places to have a tornado warning in the country this calendar year. Uh, and now Morro Bay is one of the next ones. So, you know, it's, the, I think that uh, we, we, we simplify things uh, at our peril. Uh, and now I'm going off way on a tangent, but um, the short answer is yes. Uh, but we still, you know, we, the broadcast meteorologists are, are actually uh, really important in these climate change and extreme weather conversations because these are the folks who a lot of people turn to when there is uh, an extreme event. And they're often the only voice uh, for having these kinds of conversations in a lot of parts of the country and in a lot of, for a lot of people. So it's just a tremendously important role in that sense. Um, All right, let's see what else there is. Yeah, some folks commenting on audio, you know, honestly, it is difficult because YouTube, uh, sometimes uh, when YouTube injects ads, the audio is always cranked up to 11. Another potentially out of date cultural reference, uh, but the 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 challenge is if I crank it up really high, then sometimes the, the the commercials can come in at just extreme volume. So I try not to do that to folks. I also try and keep it at a level where it's easy to increase your computer or device volume to hear me clearly without getting uh, unwanted feedback or um, pops with the audio. If it is consistently low, let me know and I can raise it for next time. It's also possible, by the way, that in this particular session, I have been speaking so much continuously during live sessions and with so many interviews over the past week that I am once again uh, starting to lose my voice. And this time I don't have a cold, so this really is from from talking uh, more than anything else. So, But I do appreciate the feedback. All right. Uh, well, thank you, uh, everybody. I'm going to take a quick look at the radar, see if there's any new tornado warnings. Uh, and there are not currently, but there is a new special weather statement for uh, Napomo and it looks like moving into Santa Maria. So this whole line, again, you know, I, I can see little structures where they're very well maybe producing water spouts. If you're out on the central coast by Point Conception, by the way, you might get a good view of a water spout. You have to get out there quick. You have to get out there in the next, uh, probably in the next 10 or 15 minutes and maybe right around sunset, Santa Barbara County coast, uh, look east, excuse me, look west, uh, you might see something interesting and it might coincide with uh, pretty dramatic storm clouds. So if you're in coastal Santa Barbara County, coastal Ventura County, or maybe the west side of LA this evening around sunset, take a look and you never know what you'll see. Uh, if there is lightning, uh, don't stand outside. Uh, but right now there's actually not a whole lot of lightning with this. So it is convective and there have been some isolated strikes, but um, you might get a pretty good vantage point of something interesting. So 
uh, localized downpours, localized flooding, and maybe even a water spout or a brief coastal tornado or two with this band. As I say, it's been, a, been an interesting week in Southern California. All right, uh, I think I'm going to call it uh, an evening. If anything crazy happens, I'll, I'll keep an eye on social media and check out uh, the Weather West comments section or the, or the, um, uh, the, the uh, Twitter uh, comments, um, whatever it's called these days. Uh, by the way, it uh, looks like Blue Sky is now open to the public, so uh, I, uh, I'm still more active on uh, X slash Twitter for now, but I think, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. So, but you all know where to find me because you're here on YouTube, so, uh, and uh, the Weather West blog will always be there too, so um, don't worry about losing track. Uh, that'll be pretty easy. It's a little bit too easy to find me, so not one of my greater concerns. All right, thank you everybody. I will probably not have another live session the rest of the week, as I mentioned in the intro, uh, but I probably will have one again by early next week, and if anything weird happens, who knows, maybe there'll be one in between, uh, but I gotta go try and write a paper, so uh, at some point I gotta do some science. All right, talk to you all later.